Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In this video, we're going to talk about the application of X-bar theory to the categories we've been discussing, the TP, the progressives, the perfectives, and the voices. And we're going to propose four categories, TP, prog P, perfect P, or perf P, and voice P. Let's start off with TP. T is the head of TP, that should be no surprise. Um, we put the TP in X-bar format, we put the subject in the specifier of that position, foreshadowing what we're going to do with specifiers more generally. Subjects are specifier positions. And the verb phrase, or other kinds of phrases, can act as the complement to the head T. The things that go in T include um, auxiliaries like um, is, have, as well as modals. In fact, modals are probably our best example of things that go in T. So should, can, will, etc. all go in T. Um, you're going to find, if you explore the syntax literature, a variety of names for the things that we've been calling the TP. It's often also called IP, or infill phrase, or agrp for agreement phrase. These are all essentially names uh, for the same thing as TP. Uh, there's sort of older names that aren't used as much, uh, but they are all names you will find. You will also sometimes find TP referenced as S. This is a very old name. S stands for sentence. Uh, you will also find the tense node sometimes called infill. All right, so now what happens with TPs in sentences where we don't have an auxiliary like will? What's going on in that kind of situation? So if we've got X-bar theory, the TP has to have a T in it because the tense and the T-bar and the TP are the obligatory parts as defined by X-bar theory. But what about sentences like Juanita loves peanut butter sandwiches? Where's the T node here? Um, if T is going to be optional, how could it possibly be the head of the TP phrase? Well, we're going to claim that there are tenses um, in sentences like this. I'm going to give you two analyses throughout this video course series. The first analysis we're going to talk about is the analysis called affix hopping. And we're going to do that now. In unit 9, we're going to come back to that and propose an alternative to affix hopping that involves selection. Both analyses work. Um, one is a little more uh, explanatory than the other. That's the selection analysis. But it also requires a lot more technology than we have right now. So uh, the affix hopping analysis is probably the easiest one to do. So here's the observation. Um, auxiliaries and modals are in complementary distribution with inflectional suffixes on the verb. So... I must dance, there's no suffix on dance. I will dance, there's no suffix on dance. I danced, there's a suffix there, and it's the past tense suffix. We have a preterite form. But you can't say, I will danced, or I can danced. These are impossible. So it looks like when you have a modal or an auxiliary, it's in complementary distribution with those suffixes on the verb. One of the things we know about complementary distribution is if you have two instances um, that cannot appear at the same time, they are likely items of the same category. So that suggests that the tense suffix is in fact of category T. This should be no surprise because it indicates tense. But it's in the wrong place. The tense node is higher and to the left of the verb. But this affix is showing up on the verb. What's our solution? One proposal, the proposal that we're pursuing in this video, is called affix hopping. And it's due to Chomsky 
1957, the probably the most classic work in syntactic theory called syntactic structures. He proposes this rule in that volume. Affix hopping is the idea that affixes are generated in the T node, and then they literally lower down onto the verb. They hop down one position. So while with a modal, we have a situation like uh, the tree on the left, where the modal occupies the T node. When we have an affix, we're going to put that affix in the T node, but we have to get it down onto the verb, and we have this special rule called affix hopping that takes that affix and moves it down. This explains those cases where uh, it appears as if the, uh, the tense information is in the wrong place. We're actually going to be able to expand this idea, along with X-bar theory, to the complex pattern of aspect and uh, voice that we talked about in the last unit, where we noticed that there, there was this strange interleaving between items that marked the 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 perfective, the progressive, and the passive voice. And we, by using affix hopping, we can correctly get all the information in the correct place. So let's start off with perfects. So you remember from the last unit, the perfects consist of the, ver the auxiliary verb have and the participle form of the, of the verb. Um, here, I'm indicating the participle form with the suffix en, just as a convenience. So now let's propose that have plus en form the head of a, um, a particular functional category we call perf, or, perf or for perfect, which itself is subject to x-bar theory. So here in this tree, we have, in fact, indicated an x-bar structure to dominate this aspectual marker. So this is our aspectual marker. It's the auxiliary have plus the marker of the participle. But again, the participle marker is in the wrong place. It really belongs down onto the verb. So we can solve that problem by using affix hopping again. We're going to take that en and we're going to move it down and hop it onto the verb below it. You can do the same thing with progressives. Progressives, you'll recall, are indicated by taking the verb to be in any of its forms and uh, making sure that the verb that follows it is in its gerundive form or gerund form, which means it's marked with ing. So the information that is involved in marking the progressive, so being marked by the progressive head, is the verb to be plus an ing suffix. Here again, we have taken progressive and we've put it into x-bar theory in order to make it fit the rest of the theory. However, this ing is in the wrong place. If we have is eating, we want the ing on eat. So we can do affix hopping again and take that ing and lower it down onto eat. And that gives us is eating. Passives, same thing. Remember, a passive is marked by the verb to be plus a participle, here again represented by the en suffix. So the passive voice taken together is be plus en, which is why they sit here together under this voice head. The voice head is x-bar theoretic, but the en is in the wrong place. It needs to be on the verb because we say was eaten. It's not been, it's was eaten. So we're going to lower that en down onto eat just the same way we did with all the other forms via affix hopping. This gives us the tight interleaving of the information you need to determine whether something is a passive, a progressive, or a perfect. Now recall that you can combine all these forms together. So you can have a complex structure that has uh, tense, it has uh, perfect, it has progressive, it has passive voice, and it has a main verb. So 
here's the sentence we're going to, to draw the diagram of. The pudding should have been being eaten at the table when Bill walked in. Uh, we're not going to leave the, off the when bit, but um, this is a, a little complicated structure. Some native speakers don't like it just because it's so complex, but it does in fact have all the allowable bits of a sentence, and highly literate English will in fact have sentences like this. So, what do we have? We have the modal should, we have have, which com when combined with the participle um, gives us the perfect. In order to make that work, we are going to um, make, we're going to put have plus the perfect marker here under the perfect head, and we're going to do affix lowering of the en onto the b, making it into the participial form. So that's have and en form the perfect. The progressive is formed by b plus a gerund. So the b part stays here underneath the progressive, but the ing actually has to appear one verb down. So the b the first B marks the progressive, and the ING on the following B marks the progressive. So we start with them together underneath the progressive head, and then we lower the ING onto the lower B. The voice, the passive voice, is indicated by E plus a, a participle. So here we have the auxiliary B, and here we have the en that marks the participle. They mark out the passive voice. But this en is in the wrong place. It shouldn't be on the verb to be, it should be on the following verb. So once again, we have the option of lowering it. And this gives us the sentence, the pudding should have been being eaten at the table when Bill walked in.